want you to do something for me. Breathe in for a couple of seconds right now, and then breathe out. Wonderful. But here in about 30 seconds, you're gonna forget that you need to breathe, but your body will breathe for you. So how do you control your breathing, but also not control your breathing? Let's get to the bottom of this. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here, where we make difficult biology concepts simple. And today we're talking about how your breathing is actually controlled. And more specifically, how you can consciously control it, but then also, most of the time, not consciously control it. So let's begin with what you just did. You voluntarily controlled your breathing. Well, how does that work? Well, there are two muscle groups we need to know about here, and they're around your rib cage. So here's your rib cage, and these are muscles that are attached from rib to rib on the outside, so we call them the external intercostal muscles. And we also need to know about this dome-shaped muscle called the diaphragm. Because when these two muscles contract together, what happens is your rib cage will be elevated, and your diaphragm will actually contract downwards thus expanding that thoracic cavity and thus allowing your lungs to fill with air. Now that is if they contract, right? But how do we actually tell them to contract, right? You voluntarily did that, so let's find out. So I have this weird looking diagram here, and this is going to represent the upper regions of the brain, the brain stem, and then these are different layers of the spinal cord. We'll get to these a little later on. But I want to focus primarily in the spinal cord, but <laughs> specifically talking about neurons that I'm going to designate as green that are lying inside of the spinal cord, and I'll say about here and here. These are just represent many clusters of neurons, so we're just going to look at one to make it simple. And this neuron here is actually going to come here and be able to communicate directly with the diaphragm, whereas this neuron below can actually come and talk to those external intercostal muscles. And they are going to basically tell these muscles when to contract. So we call these guys somatic motor neurons. And you can learn more about somatic motor neurons and how the nervous system is organized in this video here. But while we're here, know that these somatic motor neurons, when they get excited, when they send a signal, which is the goal of neurons, they will actually send what's called stimulatory neurotransmitters, which are chemicals that are going to be designated as these plus signs. And they're going to basically excite those muscles so that they contract. Now, the neurons that are controlling the diaphragm are exiting the nerve called the phrenic nerve which basically is just a bundle of a bunch of neurons signaling branch, their axon. And this phrenic nerve is located from C3 to C5, which is basically the third to the fifth cervical or top vertebrae. So remember, those are going to control the diaphragm. However, these neurons below are actually found in your thoracic nerves from T1 to about T12, give or take and they will control those external intercostals. Okay, but here's the thing. I was saying that this is all voluntary, right? What, when you breathed in, you triggered these guys to talk to these guys to contract the muscle. And when they were done contracting, you basically cut off that signal, you stopped sending those signals, therefore they could basically recoil and relax back so you could breathe out. But how did you control that? Well, if you've been in any of my classes, you know that if you can consciously control something, it's got to come from the higher regions of your brain, specifically in the cortex, which is basically the outside part of your brain. There's a lot of gray matter, a lot of which you can control and perceive and think and feel and all that wonderful stuff. But we're talking about moving muscles here. So we're talking about a specific area called the primary, I'm just gonna do one with a little circle meaning primary, motor cortex. So in the primary motor cortex, there will be these things called upper motor neurons, and they will extend from the primary motor cortex all the way down through the brainstem, down through the spinal cord, and synapse or connect with both of these neurons. And they will tell these neurons to be stimulated. So really, this is a two-neuron system. We've got the upper motor neurons up here that you can control. And through the process of just consciousness, you can trigger them to send action potentials or signals down to here, stimulate the lower motor neurons or the somatic motor neurons, thus talking to these muscles, telling them to contract. When you're done breathing in, then you can stop thinking about breathing in. You can cut off that signal, cut off this signal, and therefore these muscles will recoil back and you will breathe out. Amazing. But I told you that most of your breathing is actually done automatically. So basically, you are breathing in and out, in and out, without even consciously being aware of it. Well, how does that work? 
Well, anytime you're doing something involuntary, it's usually going to be happening within the deeper regions of your brain, specifically in this region at the base of your brain, and this is called your brainstem. And the brainstem consists of three main parts. The top part, or the most superior, is called the midbrain, which we won't talk about much in this video. Then we've got the pons. And then below that, we've got the medulla oblongata. I'll just shorten it up, medulla. Now, big picture with the brainstem, if you just need to answer a question on a test for the brainstem, it's going to deal with the automatic vital functions of your body. So think regulating heart rate and regulating breathing, right? So we're going to talk specifically about how our breathing is regulated. So before we do that, I'm going to erase this neuron basically because it's going to get in my way. But even though it disappeared, know that it is still there. You can still consciously control your breathing. Don't worry. That function won't get cut off just because I erased it on a whiteboard, right? <laughs> so the question is, how do we control these guys involuntarily within the brainstem? Well, the first thing we need to learn about is a structure in the medulla, and it's going to be called the VRG. And this is well-named. It's called the ventral respiratory group. So in terms of this picture, Make sure that you notice that I'm facing this way. I'm taking a mid-sagittal section, and you're looking inside my brainstem and spinal cord. So basically, this is the front side or ventral side. That's the posterior or dorsal side. So if it's in the ventral aspect of the medulla, it's called the ventral respiratory group. Now, in the ventral respiratory group, I'm going to draw a couple of different neurons here. A cluster of neurons I'm going to draw on the bottom side, and they're going to be in green. And any time I draw in green, I want you to know that these neurons are going to be stimulatory, okay? But then I'm also going to draw things in red. And there's going to be neurons up here that are going to be in red, and I'm going to put them as a minus sign because they're actually going to be inhibitory. So for the rest of this video, if it, I draw a green, it means it's going to stimulate. If I draw a red, it means it's going to inhibit. All right, cool. So in the ventral respiratory group, the main part I want you to focus in on is this uh, inferior part here. Here's a region inside the ventral respiratory group, and I'm going to dot it off here, and it's going to be called the pre-Botzinger complex. And these guys will contain those stimulatory neurons that will be able to involuntarily, you don't control these, talk to those somatic motor neurons and thus trigger them to begin the process of inspiration or the process of breathing in. Okay? Now what's fascinating, once again, these are involuntary neurons, is that these set a type of pace for your breathing, right? And if you're quiet breathing right now, you're not thinking about it, you're probably going to be breathing in anywhere from 12 to 20 breaths per minute. That's a rhythm, right? It almost seems like they have a pace that's set to them, right? So what's interesting is the neurons inside the pre-Botzinger complex are considered to be pacemaker cells. Now, the only other time we've talked about pacemaker cells is in the pacemaker cells of the heart, which you can learn more about here in cardiac action potentials. But the goal of these pacemaker cells is to basically spontaneously stimulate inspiration by triggering these guys to talk to the inspiratory muscles. Amazing. But the problem is, is that we don't want to just inspire, 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 because if we breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, we wouldn't breathe out, breathe out, breathe out, right? So within the ventral respiratory group itself, we will have these basically inhibitory neurons that are going to come and communicate down to these guys in the pre-Botzinger complex and inhibit them. Now this occurs also in a rhythm. So if I can't really draw this, but the neurons that started the inspiration, they will fire, fire, fire for about two seconds. And then these guys will get inhibited because these will begin firing for about three seconds and actually tell these guys to quit their signals right? Because if they quit their signals after a couple seconds, all of this process will be shut down, these muscles will relax, and you will breathe out. So what's fascinating is within the ventral respiratory group, we already have basically your ability to breathe in for a couple seconds as this guy fires, and then breathe out for a few seconds as this guy fires and inhibits this process. Amazing. So that's just during a process of basically quiet breathing or relaxed breathing, which is coined by the term eupnea or true breathing, essentially. So the VRG is probably the most important section of your brainstem to help you breathe automatically without thinking about it. But the problem becomes when you're under different circumstances, right? Sometimes you're exercising. What do you want to do when you're exercising? Well, obviously, you want to increase your respiratory rate. Sometimes you get hit by something and you want to make that sound, right? 
that's not a very good example. But there's other ways that your respiratory rate can be controlled in different environments and circumstances. So we need a lot of other players involved in this process. But if this has been helpful so far, I would love it if you would like this video, subscribe to the channel. I'll make a ton more videos making complex things like this a little more simple for you. So let's move on to the next structure. The next structure is well named. It's going to be called the DRG. And if you've been following along, the DRG stands for dorsal respiratory group because it's on the dorsal side. Now, the dorsal respiratory group is very important because it is able to basically test the waters of your body, test different environments, figure out what's going on, and then communicate to these guys to essentially alter that respiratory rhythm. So what are some things that could adjust our respiratory rate? Let's talk about three of them that are going to affect the DRG. So let me draw them real quick. All right, so we've got three different structures here that I want to talk about. The first one being skeletal muscles, okay? Skeletal muscles have these small receptors in them that are connected to sensory neurons, and these little receptors are called proprioceptors. Now, a couple things proprioceptors do. Number one is that they actually uh, tell your body where you are in space. So if you were to close your eyes and kind of hold your arm out, you feel where your arm is, right, because of proprioceptors. But proprioceptors also detect basically the stretching and contracting of your muscles. So if your proprioceptors are stimulated, it means that your muscle is undergoing a lot of contractions, right? Usually meaning you're exercising, right? So if you're exercising, what's fascinating is that the sensory neurons that contain those little proprioceptors will send signals to the dorsal respiratory group and tell it, yo, we're exercising. What do you think we need to do to the respiratory rate then? Well, we obviously need to stimulate it. We need to increase the respiratory rate because we're responding to the exercise. When you're exercising, you need more air and a gas exchange. So what will happen is that information will get to the dorsal respiratory group that that's not enough, right? Because we need to tell who to basically breathe. Well, we need to tell the ventral respiratory group so that they can talk to these neurons to make the muscles contract. So this is not a perfectly drawn diagram, but no, once that stimulatory information reaches the dorsal respiratory group, it's going to stimulate the ventral respiratory group to increase its respiratory rate. Wonderful. Now, at the same time, say we have some sort of damage to our body, some sort of uh, skin damage, or maybe some sort of muscle tear, or some sort of drastic, painful stimulus. So we will have these pain receptors, also called nociceptors, and they can directly detect painful stimuli. Well, obviously, if you are in pain, that means there's some sort of stressful stimulus going on. So interestingly, that will directly communicate with the DRG once again and say, hey, we need to increase that respiratory rate because there's something dangerous nearby, so we need to be prepared to fight it off. It's almost an example of kind of a fight or flight response, right? Increases respiratory rate. Now, the last thing is actually the reverse. As you can see, it's in red. We're going to actually inhibit or slow down the respiratory rate. And this is going to occur when the lungs are experiencing excess stretching. So this is kind of an interesting one to think about, but try your best right now, if you want to practice this, try your best to breathe in as much as you possibly can and just keep breathing in and in and in and in. Okay, ready? Do it with me. <laughs> That's not very fun, right? It's not very fun. It's actually painful. And what's happening inside of your lungs is your lungs have these stretch receptors. And they do not like to be overstretched, overstrained, right? So what's going to happen is the stretch receptors are connected to these neurons that will come talk to the DRG, but I want to be very specific about this. Once it gets to the DRG, it's going to force the information down to the pre-Botzinger complex that we talked about and directly inhibit it. Why is that? Well, did you notice what happened after you breathed in a lot? You were almost forced, in a way, to breathe out right? That's because there are these involuntary controls where the stretch receptors detect excess stretching. We talk to the DRG. DRG immediately sends that information to the VRG, inhibiting those guys from being stimulated, thus inhibiting the downwards cascade, and therefore relaxing these muscles to breathe out. Absolutely fascinating. Okay, so these things can all control, obviously, our respiratory rate involuntarily. But probably the most important one is found in a little region of the medulla, and I'm just going to place it here, although it's actually located all the way through the medulla. They found different centers for this. And this region will have a lot of nuclei with things called central chemoreceptors. 
Okay, so centralized chemoreceptors. Well, chemo means chemical, and receptor means to detect information. So inside here, we're going to be detecting basically different chemicals, specifically in the bloodstream. Now, I'm going to divide this up into two parts just to make it a little easier. And we're going to zoom in on this section up here. Okay, so what I've drawn here is basically inside the bloodstream, we've got little chemoreceptors right here attached to those neurons in both cases. Now, the question is, what type of chemicals, right, can trigger these neurons to either increase respiratory rate or decrease respiratory rate? So I'm going to draw two different scenarios, one where we're actually going to trigger the increase of respiratory rate and another where we're going to basically diminish or decrease the respiratory rate. So let's start with what can increase that respiratory rate. Three main things, and let's talk about why. The first will be an increase of CO2. Anytime you increase your CO2 amount in your bloodstream, it usually means that your cells are respiring more, right? They're, they're making more energy because they're doing something important like exercising, right? So you're going to have this bump up in CO2 that will trigger that sensory neurons, chemoreceptors, and thus stimulate the VRG to increase its respiratory rate. But that's not the only thing that can actually is increase the respiratory rate. The second thing is actually a decreased pH. So this is called being in a condition of acidosis or a slightly acidotic state where your blood pH dropped. That can be due to too much CO2, which you can learn about right here in this video about what CO2 does to pH. But it can also be caused by, for example, a diabetic ketoacidosis or kidney failure. All of these things can lead to an acidotic state. And usually what will happen is the symptom will be an increased respiratory rate due to the acid. Now, the last thing and less so will be a decrease of oxygen. Now, if obviously there's a decrease of oxygen, we need to breathe more in, but that actually doesn't control these guys as much. It doesn't stimulate them as much as the pH and the carbon dioxide. So all of those things are things that will increase that respiratory rate, stimulate the VRG to obviously stimulate inspiratory muscles. But if you think about it, what would inhibit the VRG or what would prevent those signals from actually getting there? Well, you could probably think of it as just the reverse, right? Let's say we have too little CO2. Let's say we have an increased pH, and let's say we have high oxygen levels. In that case, we have really no reason to breathe in more, right? It's not drawn exactly how I did, but it'll actually decrease the respiratory rate if these conditions are happening. So just to give you an example, if you have a high pH, that's called an alkalotic state. You can learn more about alkalosis here, but when you are in an alkalotic state, a lot of the time your respiratory rate is quite depressed. Okay, you have a very low respiratory rate, say below 12. I kind of saved the best for last year, so stick with me. The last region of the brain that can influence the respiratory rate is this main region called the PRG, or the pontine respiratory group. And this PRG will work hand in hand with a small center just dorsal to it called the apneustic center which basically means excessive breathing in, okay? So let's start with that. The apneustic center will actually be able to communicate with either the DRG or the VRG directly. And as you notice, I drew it in green, and that's because the apneustic center really, really, really amplifies the effect of breathing in. Now, at the same time, that PRG, the pontine respiratory group, can also influence the DRG and the VRG, and it can basically modulate the respiratory rhythm is how it's written in the textbooks. So it can have either stimulatory effects, but it can also have inhibitory effects as well. So this is when I want to bring up a really important analogy for you, okay? Let's imagine you're just in a normal office building, right? So in a general office, you're going to have all levels of the hierarchy, right? You're going to have the main workers, right, that are slaving away, doing all the jobs that nobody wants to do, but you're doing the majority of the work. That's going to be the VRG, right? Without anything above it, the VRG is just doing its job and making things happen. But sometimes in the business, conditions change, right? And so usually when conditions change, what happens is maybe the boss figures out that something's wrong, right? Something's wrong. We've got to change up our work scheme, right? So in that case, the boss will communicate with the worker, right, to alter his or her work. But at the same time, what if something higher up changes, right? Maybe something big. Maybe, for example, we're getting some feedback from higher brain regions, like the limbic system that fires off during fight or flight, 
Some massive change happened. Something very bad is occurring in the world of the business. I'm not sure what business we want to be in. That information ain't going to the worker. That information isn't even going to your boss. It's going to go to the CEO. And the CEO has virtually pull in any one direction. Now, the apneustic center is kind of off to the side. I would almost consider that the COO just a little less than the CEO. But if the CEO went out, do you think the business could still run? Absolutely. Absolutely. The apneustic center will take over and make sure everything's working properly. If the apneustic center goes out and the CEO, will everything work properly? Actually, yes. We can still respond to several different things, right? We can respond to the chemoreceptors. We can respond to all these receptors going to the DRG to the BRG. But once you start messing up the DRG and the VRG, that's when respiration is really compromised, okay? So think of this in terms of a hierarchy, right? There's going to be those neurons that directly talk to the muscles. If they're being stimulated, we're contracting. If they're not being stimulated, we are relaxing and breathing out. They are directly talked to only by the VRG, right? The VRG controls them. But the VRG has inputs from all these different places to alter its rhythm, most of which are going to be that involuntary control in the brainstem, but some, as we mentioned at the very beginning, can come from the motor cortex, which can override everything and then directly talk to it itself. For more on the respiratory system, I recommend hopping over to the overview here. And I also mentioned a lot of videos about acidosis and alkalosis, so you can check out a lot of videos on that right here.